At some point you might have noticed these ring or donut shaped things that are sometimes uh, on high voltage transmission lines or related equipment. Now these things are called corona rings and in today's video we're going to take a look at what they're used for among some other things that might be interesting. So I'm at a place where this uh, high voltage transmission line uh, goes into an underground cable uh, which is actually quite a rare thing to do for a 400 kilovolt line like this so uh, but anyway the, the reason I'm here is because this thing has corona rings on it in literally pretty much all shapes and sizes and they're absolutely everywhere on this thing and so I thought it would be a nice location to get some footage and to talk about what these things are for. Now the dielectric strength of air is about 3 million volts per meter so that means if you expose air to an electric field that is stronger than 3 million volts per meter it'll break down and it'll start to conduct electricity it becomes ionized. So essentially that means if you have two wires spaced one meter apart if you apply more than a million volts, sorry, more than three million volts between them, uh, an electric arc will jump across. Now, of course, in this scenario, as you can see, <laughs> there's no electric arcs because obviously the people who designed this made sure to put the wires plenty far apart and plenty far away from the ground and other objects. But the fact that there is no arc doesn't mean that the electric field can't be strong enough to ionize air locally. You see, even if there is no electric arc, particularly close to sharp points and edges on conductors, the electric field can be strong enough to break down the air and ionize it. Uh, and in that case, you get something called corona discharge, which is basically where charge leaks away from the conductor into the surrounding air, which represents an energy loss if you're a power company. So you want to try and minimize that loss, and the way you do it is by minimizing the amount of sharp points and edges on the conductors, because that's where the electric field is very strong. So the solution is to make everything as smooth and round as possible. But sometimes, of course, that's not practical. Um, and so what you can do instead is put something round and smooth around it. So for example if I zoom in on this you can see the thing in the middle is pretty edgy and so the electric field around it, around its edges, could possibly be very strong and ionize a lot of air but what they've done is they put that corona ring, that donut, uh, around it so that because the voltage of the ring and the thing in the middle is the same the electric field in between them is pretty much nothing. But the field that emerges from the ring isn't that strong because the ring is smooth and round. So that's the reason why they put these rings uh, on this equipment. But of course that just leaves us with the question of why is the electric field much stronger around sharp points and edges? Uh, so to discuss this in a little bit more detail, let's head back inside. Right, so let's imagine that we have an electric field uh, and it has a constant field strength regardless of where you are inside it. So the field strength is the same in every single location uh, and it is 100 volts per meter. So that's the strength of this electric field. Now, volts per meter is obviously the most common unit for measuring electric field strength, but there is another unit you could use, which is Newtons per Coulomb. And these two things actually mean exactly the same. So a, a field that has a strength of 100 volts per meter is also a field that is 100 newtons per coulomb. And this is because, uh, let's say we, we took a test charge of one coulomb and we placed that inside of our 100 volt per meter electric field. Now, because this field is also 100 newtons per coulomb, it means that our test charge, which is one coulomb, uh, will experience a force of 100 newtons, trying to push it sideways in this case. Now let's say that we wanted to take this charge and, and move it through the field, move it against the electric field, 
and we want to move it over a distance of uh, one meter. So doing this is going to require some effort, right? Because we have to push this charge against the electric field. So we have to put in some effort. Uh, we have to apply at least 100 newtons of force to overcome the electric field pushing against us. And because we're going to move it over a distance of one meter, we have to apply that force for one meter of distance. Now, energy, energy is just force times distance, right? So the energy that we consume or that we use to do this uh, will be uh, 100 newtons of force multiplied by one meter of distance, uh, which means we used 100 joules of energy. And that energy will now be stored as potential energy in that charge. And I think a good way to compare this or a good analogy for this is like you're rolling some object up a hill, right? You, you're, you're moving an object uphill, it gains uh, altitude, you're storing potential energy in it. That, that's kind of what's happening here. Now, voltage, as you might have learned at some point in secondary school, is energy per unit of charge, so joules per coulomb, right? So in this case, we've stored 100 joules of energy in one coulomb of charge. So we could also say that we've gained uh, 100 volts of potential. And we did it over a distance of one meter. So we've gained uh, 100 volts of potential over 100, sorry, over one meter of distance, which means uh, 100 volts per meter. So this is why volts per meter means the same thing as newtons per coulomb. But I think this is interesting because it sort of reveals the two different ways that you can look in the electric field. You can, you can think of it as how much force is being applied to a given amount of charge, which is sort of what newtons per coulomb uh, implies. But you could also think of it as sort of a slope or a gradient, as in like how much potential do I gain when I move a certain distance, and that is what the volt per meter uh, sort of reveals. All right, so knowing that, uh, let's take a look at a different scenario, okay? So let's say we now have a, a point charge, which is located right here, and that point charge produces an electric field, because it, really all charges produce an electric field, right? So this electric field uh, comes out of this point and it spreads out in all directions. The total electric field, sort of all of the electric field that comes out of that charge, is what we call the electric flux. And for the electric flux, we usually use this symbol right here. It's, it's phi, capital phi usually. And according to this equation, the electric flux, so that is all of the electric field that comes out of that point, is equal to the amount of charge that is here uh, divided by a constant called the permittivity. Right, now for this video, I don't really care about that permittivity because it's just a constant number. It's gonna be the same throughout the whole thing. Uh, it's not really important for now. So we're just gonna leave it out. Um, and basically what we can say is that the uh, electric uh, flux is proportional to, we're just going to use this little thingy, proportional to the amount of charge. Because if you have double the amount of charge, you're going to have you know, two times as much electric flux. And the fact that there is a little constant in there, it's not really important for now. All right. Okay. So now what you might have seen about this already is that in this case, we're not going to have a, a constant field strength like we did before in that simple example. Because here, the field strength is going to depend on where you are. If you are close to this charge, you experience a very strong electric field. If you're far away from this charge, you're going to experience a much weaker electric field. And this is where a little bit of geometry comes in. So we know that this electric flux spreads out in all directions. So it has a sort of, it expands in the shape of a sphere. And the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi times radius squared, which shows us that if you have a sphere, you make it like double the radius, uh, its surface area becomes four times as big, right? So that also means in this scenario, if you're in some location and you double your distance from this center, 
the electric flux will have spread out over four times the surface area and so the electric field that you will see or experience uh, will be four times as weak because the electric field or the field strength is basically the amount of electric flux per square meter or per square centimeter or per square inch whatever so if we want an expression like a maths formula for the electric field strength at a given distance uh, from this charge basically it's the amount of flux oh that's ugly let me do that again I'm not left-handed but this like the video recording setup is is this way so I have to deal with it <laughs> anyway so it's the amount of flux per unit of area right per square meter per square centimeter whatever and the area well that's the area the surface area of a sphere uh, which we just saw was uh, 4 pi times radius squared and so that is our electric field our electric field that is the the strength of the electric field in a given location you know at a given distance <clears throat> uh, from that center is the electric flux divided by 4 pi times radius squared and of course since flux is directly proportional to the amount of charge you could also just say well it's actually just you know, charge like this so it's charge divided by 4 pi times radius squared okay nice but now what about the voltage uh, what if we are in like let's say we are in a certain place uh, i don't know we put a test charge like uh, right here okay and we're going to move this test charge towards the center towards this one over here let's say move it from here to uh, to here for example right and we want to know how much voltage it's gained right how much potential it gains as it covers this distance now previously that was pretty easy to calculate because we just multiplied the force by the distance right it's just you know we had this field it was 100 volts per meter so if we move one meter we gain 100 volts if we gain three meters we gain 300 volts simple as that in this case not that easy because the strength of the field is going to change along the way so if you want to use that sort of going up a hill analogy again it's like going up a hill but the slope changes it gets steeper along the way and so calculating how how much uh, elevation you gain is not quite as simple so what you could do uh, what an approach that would work is let's say you didn't move all this way in one go but you moved only a tiny bit so let's say you only covered this little bit of distance and you made the assumption that in that little zone the electric field more or less has the same strength because you're not moving that far so this change it doesn't change that much so you're just going to calculate one number for the field strength in that zone assume that it's constant and multiply that by this little distance so you get a small voltage gain and then you just repeat that a whole bunch of times until you reach the end you add them all up and then you have your like complete voltage or potential gain uh, from moving that distance and of course the smaller you make those little bits of movement the more accurate this becomes uh, until you know, if they're infinitely small uh, you get the answer now people who are good at maths uh, will realize that what you're doing there is essentially just integrating and so basically what you're doing is you're integrating this and if you do that what comes out of it is something that looks like this it says that voltage is equal to charge uh, divided by 4 pi times radius not radius squared this time just radius um, and that's the voltage given that infinitely far away from that charge would be zero volts otherwise you would have to add some constant but usually people consider infinite distance to be equal to zero volts of potential so this comes out to be um, the solution if you were to integrate this if you were to use the numerical approach like take tiny little steps uh, until you get there you find that the the values that come out of it are in accordance with this as well 
But this is very interesting, because it shows that voltage has a different relationship with distance or radius uh, from electric field, because with the electric field equation it's radius squared, and with voltage it's just radius. So let's say that I'm at a certain distance away from this, from this charge, and I cut that distance in half, then I get four times the electric field, but only double the voltage. And that's really what's happening, and why the electric field is strong around sharp points and edges. Because the thing is, let's say you have a, a metal sphere, uh, and on the surface of that sphere is a bunch of charge. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to compress that, that sphere. So we're going to make it smaller so that its radius is cut in half. So we're going to make it basically twice as small in terms of diameter. Now, what would happen in that case? Well, all of that charge would move closer to the center. So you're sort of compressing it together. So it gains voltage, right? The potential goes up. And as we've seen, if you cut the radius in half, you get double the voltage. So the voltage of the sphere would double if you cut the radius in half. But what if you didn't want that to happen? What if you wanted to maintain the same voltage? Well, if you look at that voltage equation again, you can see you could do that by removing some charge. So if you cut the radius in half, but you also cut the amount of charge in half, then you can keep the same voltage. So if you let half the charge escape from the sphere while you are compressing it, uh, then you can maintain the same voltage. But what would happen to the electric field at the surface of the sphere? In our electric field equation, if you cut the radius in half, Despite the fact that you also cut the charge in half, the electric field is still going to be twice as strong because radius is squared in this one. And so, on our little sphere, uh, even though it has the same voltage, the electric field at its surface will be twice as strong. And so, the electric field, or the strength of the electric field at the surface, is directly related to the radius. If you cut the radius in half, you get double the electric field strength at the surface, assuming that the voltage remains constant. Let's say you had these two spheres. Let's say they existed at the same time and they were connected to each other through a wire so that they are kept at the same voltage. In that case, the electric field would be strongest around the little sphere. And from there on, it's just a small step to sort of morph this into a shape that has a blunt and a pointy side and you can see how the pointy side has the strongest electric field near its surface and that's why you get a stronger electric field near pointy sides and edges on objects because that's where the radius is effectively the smallest and that's why you put those rings on uh, transmission equipment sometimes but of course this extends beyond corona rings in general, it just means for high voltage equipment, it's a good thing to make everything as round and big and smooth as possible. And that's why I like these high voltage lab devices uh, always use big spheres and stuff like that. It's to prevent charge from leaking away uh, because that makes the device usually work way less well. Uh, or in the case of a commercial transmission line, it's actually like a commercial loss. It's a loss of energy. Uh, that you want to prevent. Anyway, so uh, that's it. That's why these little rings are on power lines. There's a, a pretty uh, elaborate story behind it, it turns out, that you can make a pretty long video about, I see on the little counter. Uh, regardless of that, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and all that's left for me is, of course, to say thank you very much for watching. Just know that when people see you filming like this, you know, there's two possibilities. Basically, either they think you are some sort of spy uh, trying to film critical infrastructure, uh, or you are an absolute weirdo who, like, who likes looking at power lines. And, um, well, I guess I belong in the second category. <laughs>